welcome to our very first Creature Features. This is a super exciting partnership with Science North and Little Ray's Nature Centers. And I have the pleasure of introducing everyone today to Kevin Dungy, who is the director of Little Ray's Nature Centers at the Hamilton location. So hi, Kevin. Hi, guys. Hi, Megan. <laughs> hi. So thank you so much for being here with us today. I know I'm super pumped about this. Um, for everyone watching, Please, if you have any questions for Kevin about the animals or about uh, Little Ray's Nature Center, put them in the comments below, and then I'll make sure to work them into our conversation today. So, Kevin, we are going to see some live animals from your nature center, right? Oh, yeah, I'm excited. Awesome. So, and there is a bit of a theme also in the animals that you're choosing to show us today, but let's not reveal what it is yet. Let's try and see if we can guess after that second animal. Does that sound like a good plan? Sounds great. Awesome. <laughs> great. Okay, so who do you have for us first? Uh, my first animal here, there, guys. We call him Big Papa. And uh, I just kind of had him sitting here beside me because I know. Uh, not really the fastest animals in the world. I knew he wasn't gonna run away on me or anything like that. Big Papa, can you see him okay? Big Papa is a red-footed tortoise. And uh, they're about the sixth largest species of tortoise in the world. So he's not full grown just yet, guys. He can get uh, well, well over 20 pounds and he can live a really long time as well. Something that tortoises are really well known for. Now, tortoises are found all around the globe. Uh, unfortunately, not in Canada, but we do have tortoises in North America, down in the southern United States. Uh, for red-footed tortoises, you're going to find these guys down in South America uh, with a pretty wide range, actually, uh, all the way from maybe, let's say, in uh, like Central America, the bottom country there in Panama, all the way down to northern Argentina. And uh, like I said, they're about the sixth largest species of tortoise in the world. Now, uh, big question that we get with these guys is, well, I mean, what's the difference between a turtle and a tortoise? Right. I mean, <laughs> you know what, guys? Uh, one of my biggest pet peeves out there is if somebody says, oh, look at the, look at the turtle over there. And then somebody says, listen, guys, it's, a, it's not a turtle. It's a, it's a tortoise. Well, guess what? They're all turtles. Every <laughs> single tortoise in the world is a turtle, just like frogs and toads. All toads are types of frogs, but not all frogs are toads. Just like turtles and tortoises. All tortoises are turtles, but not all turtles are tortoises. So what's so the big difference there the anyways there, guys? What do you so say? So how would you tell the difference then? A big difference, I mean, if you see a turtle swimming in the water, that's a true aquatic turtle. If we take a look, I'm not sure how good my camera is here, but if we take a look at Big Papa's feet, I mean, his back foot is not really much unlike a, like a small stompy elephant's foot. And even his front feet, you're going to see that he doesn't have any webbing between his toes. He doesn't have flippers for feet. So they're really not designed for aquatic life whatsoever. They don't really swim. Now, if I put him in the water, he's not going to sink or anything like that. They don't drown. They do tend to kind of float around on the top. They kind of bob around. They might be able to get a little locomotion there in the water. But you're certainly not going to see a tortoise diving underneath the surface of the water. And that's really how turtles do protect themselves, their friends, especially the turtles here in Canada. Uh, aquatic turtles, if they get nervous, they just dive into the water. I mean, a lot of people think they're just going to whoop, pop inside of their shell to hide. But they're usually close to the water. They'll just dive into the water, dive underneath the water, swim away, and it's a great line of defense. But when it comes to tortoises that are unable to swim or dive underneath the water, it's the tortoises and the land turtles that have that ability to go right inside of their shell. And he can pull his legs forward. He can completely hide his face. And then he's really well protected uh, from the predators that they may have, which really aren't that many. I mean, when they're when they're little, 
and even especially the eggs uh eggs can get eaten by big lizards like tegus or uh other other animals out there once they're bigger their hard protective shell is really really good the only predators that they really have to worry about are well i mean unfortunately humans there are humans in south america that will use them for meat and they can they can eat them no problem right. or a jaguar a jaguar that's a jaguar big cat in south america they have such a strong bite uh, they're actually able to bite through a small adult uh tortoise's shell which is crazy jaguars are amazing amazing animals um so Kevin, i have a, i have a question then so you were saying how um well, comparing to our ontario turtles like are, are many of our ontario species actually all of our ontario species are species at risk and you mentioned humans being a threat to tortoises. So is this an example of an endangered species? Are red-footed tortoises an endangered species? Red-footed tortoises uh, luckily are not, uh, not endangered. They are still considered to be at risk of extinction. Right now they're considered to be vulnerable, okay. uh, which does mean their numbers are declining. And I mean, animal numbers declining around the world. Number one reason, guys, is loss of habitat. Right. Um, so if these guys don't have the jungles and the forests to live in anymore, if it's been uh, completely clear cut for uh, like farming or, or whatever for like a cattle pasture, well, I mean, they just, I mean, they just don't have anywhere to live anymore. So unfortunately, so it's, not unlike, it's not unlike then our turtles here in Canada then where habitat loss is like the biggest thing for these guys. For our for our eight turtle species here in Ontario, there guys, they are all at risk of extinction. Whether it's just like special concern, uh, all the way up to endangered. Um, main reason is loss of habitat, and I have seen uh, like in my lifetime, guys. And I mean, over let's say over the period of two years, uh, I used to live outside of Ottawa and uh, in a little town called Franktown, which is the Lila capital of Ontario. And I used to drive to uh, I used to drive down the road down the highway uh, to Carlton Place to do my groceries because <coughs> Franktown didn't have a grocery store. And guys, when I moved there, uh, Carlton Place was a pretty small area. It was a pretty small town, and it had a huge field that was grassland and wetland. And during the time that I lived there, <coughs> excuse me. I watched that grassland, guys. I watched that beautiful property get totally leveled. It became, and there's nothing wrong with these stores, guys. I, I, I shop at all of these stores, okay? But they built like a Walmart, a Home Depot, a giant grocery store, everything that comes along with that with Starbucks and Staples and then giant concrete uh, parking lots as well. Right. And I used to see all types of animals in that habitat. Um, right. Not really a lot of turtles in that part, but lots of snakes, uh, lots of butterflies and other insects, uh, lots of birds that just, I mean, they can't live there anymore, guys. They don't have that habitat anymore. And that's just one little example that I personally witnessed over just a couple of years in the area that I live. That sort of thing is happening literally all over the world, all over the world. And right. I mean, the human population is is totally exploding. I mean, I remember, guys, when I was born, <clears throat> the, 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 the global population of humans was about three and a half billion. We're, we're coming up on eight billion people now. And the more people, the more space we need, the more of those Home Depots and Walmarts that we need. And they're just less and less and less space for, 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 for our wildlife and animals. So it's just so incredibly important um, <clears throat> to, to, to protect those areas. Uh, I, I just, I, I can't, I can't stress that enough. So we actually have um, somebody commenting on what you're what you're saying there, Kevin, and it's um, from Stephen McIntyre, and he's, I know, eh? I was wondering why they may, why they may benefit the turtle. So, not sure, Stephen, if you want to elaborate on that, if you can, to comment again and maybe clarify a little bit what you're asking. But we do have another question um, from someone. Uh, Renata is asking, what are the bumps on Big Papa's back? Oh, these are just, I mean, these are just part of his carapace. You can see okay. it's pretty lumpy there. Uh, often it's a lot smoother than that. And this shell, I guess, I guess, I mean, there's a layer of keratin over top, which is kind of like, 
basic building block in nature from uh, fur and, and feathers and hair and oh, right. fingernails and a thin layer of keratin. But underneath this, guys, most of the most of that shell is comprised of bone. It's part of his skeleton. So <clears throat> like his, his spine, his backbone, his ribs are all flattened out, his chest plate all create this hard protective shell. And if they're eating a nice, good, healthy, perfectly healthy diet, uh, most of these tortoise species are gonna have a nice smooth kind of rounded domed shell. Uh, but if they're not, again, maybe not getting the calcium that they need in that diet. Remember, a lot of our animals uh, have been rescued in, in one way or another. A lot of them used to be people's pets. Not everybody, and I, I know you're, you're aware of this too there, Miss Megan, not everybody does all the research necessary uh, before they go out and, and, and get a new family pet. So, really oh, Kevin, you might have to yeah. you might have to backtrack just a little bit because I think we okay. there. But that's um, okay. yeah, no, that's okay. And and that comment from Stephen McIntyre was actually about the bumps and whether or not there was a benefit to the people to have those bumps. No, it's better to, for, it's actually better for them to have a smoother shell. Um, <clears throat> over top, it's a keratin, but underneath that shell is comprised of their bones, uh, their spine, their ribs, their, their chest plate, all kind of wrapped around their body. And if they're getting the proper diet and all the calcium that they need and the proper nutrients that they need, that shell most, like, it, it, it would be more s smooth, more rounded. Right. Uh, but I mean, uh, calcium deficiency is a big problem out there and uh, metabolic bone disease. And I think you may have missed me saying that most of our animals here at Little Rays uh, have been rescued in one way or another. So, uh, like, I, I mean, a lot of them used to be people's pets. And I was right. saying that I know that you're familiar with this. I just wish I wish everybody would do the, the amount of research uh, necessary uh, before they bring a new pet into the into the home into the family, uh, yeah. because these guys do require uh, some, some, some pretty specific things like proper lighting and and uh, proper supplements. Like I mean, not just a healthy diet, proper supplements added to that diet as well. And a lot of people might think, oh, it's okay. Tortoises just eat vegetation. That's all they need. They just throw them some lettuce, some cucumber. No, the I mean, for for red footed tortoises, they're actually omnivorous. They're omnivorous. For us. They, they'll eat uh, like animal matter as well. Uh, they'll eat like different bugs and worms and right. slugs and that sort of, often carrion, like dead animals they'll even eat there, guys. So right. uh, we absolutely just 100% have to, have to, have to do our research uh, 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 be before we bring in a new in a, in a new animal to our family. And you, you just, just, just answered my last question. question. One quick thing here, be just quickly uh, talking about turtles as pets, guys. I mean, you can find uh, a, a pet turtle in pretty much any pet store, um, and they'll sell them to pretty much anybody as well. Nothing against pet stores, guys. I love pet stores. Uh, there's a lot of good ones out there, but they don't always tell you that those cute little red-eared sliders, those cute little, those cute little aquatic turtles that are about like the size, a little bit bigger than a toonie, maybe. They don't tell you that they're going to live 60 to 80 years. Guys, I mean, who's going to take care of this? Your child, your 10-year-old child's not going to take care of a turtle for, for 60 years. And they get dropped off here all the time, guys. So please, just, just please, 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 please do your research. And uh, if you're thinking about getting a pet turtle, maybe, maybe get something different. Thank you. Although some people can definitely take care of their turtles. I've seen some really, really good uh, care out there. Guys, I just, I'm going to be back 30 seconds. Save that question for me. Somebody pooped on my hand. Oh, lovely. <laughs> that is so funny. Yes, no, absolutely. For those of you watching, if you have any other questions, pop them in the comments right now. And we'll, as soon as Kevin gets back, we will definitely move on to our next animal. But um, here at Science North, we actually do get quite a few phone calls about rehoming their pet turtles. And unfortunately, we just don't have the space or time or um, to, to actually house all of these animals that we sometimes do get calls for as well. So 
it definitely happens here at Science North as well, um, as it does with with you and, and trying to rehome these pets. And there are some great organizations out there that are actually, that is their purpose, is to rehome pets that maybe have outgrown current home. Um, but unfortunately, we just can't do any of that work here. One, one of the best organizations out there, guys, the Ontario Turtle Conservation Centre. Uh, yeah. They work and rehabilitate so many uh, yeah. wild, wild turtles yeah. uh, every single Single year, I just can't. I can't say enough good things about them. Yeah. Okay, mm. Kevin. Let's move on to our next animal then. Something else. Yeah. Let's let's try another animal. See if people can guess our theme for today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This next animal, everybody's going to know what it is, and uh, it's often a very very favorite animal as well. They're beautiful. <clears throat> Found on the other side of the world. And some of these guys are going to find in Madagascar. This one is but not from Madagascar. <clears throat> this is Camellio. Wow. I'm going to get a good shot of him here. <clears throat> Camellio. Beautiful. Veiled chameleon. Now, a veiled chameleon, guys, is only one species of chameleon. Uh, there's so many different types of chameleons out there. When I say there's several species, I'm talking about over 150 different species of chameleon. Close to, I think it's just over 170 different types or different species of chameleon in the world. And about half of those species are found uh, on the island of Madagascar. Okay, and the other ones are kind of spread throughout Africa and uh, Asia. And then the veiled chameleon like this guy, they're found on kind of like a kind of like a, des a bit of a deserty mountain range <clears throat> between uh, well, in Saudi Arabia and Yemen, Yemen. Wow, he's gorgeous. I'm pretty sure it's Yemen. It's Yemen. Okay. Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Now, chameleons are really, really well designed for arboreal life or life yeah. in the trees. And let's look at a few cool adaptations they have for, for living in the trees. First of all, his normal color, guys, he's a nice, calm, relaxed color right now. This is his normal color, his normal pattern. And he would be perfectly camouflaged uh, against the leaves and for life in the trees. Also, the tail, we can see that beautiful curled up tail. His tail is also prehensile, so he can hang on to branches while he's up in that tree, just in case maybe he takes a, a little bit of a slip, wrong step. No. <laughs> Can chameleons, really what? can chameleons lose their tails, Kevin, like other li they like some lizards? No, they, they cannot. Like a lot of other lizards can, and to, as a sign of defense, these guys cannot. Right. Now, if we look at their feet, how's the how's the picture quality? Is it? It's pretty bad? good on my end. Yeah. Now, I hope everyone can do see have that. five toes on each foot, but three toes are stuck together and two toes are stuck together. And it creates these little gripping, kind of like a little caliper style, little gripping feet, perfectly designed for climbing around on branches, which is, he's a lot more comfortable on a branch than he is on my hand. Doesn't love being held on my hand. So we'll always hold him uh, like this on a branch. Perfect. And then when he's hunting predators, you gotta keep in mind that, 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 this, that, that chameleons don't have ear openings. Okay, they, so they can't really hear, uh, definitely can't hear the way that we do. So if he's hunting a bug and he's focusing his eyes and all of his attention on the bug, well, there might be a predator coming up behind him, coming to kind of maybe you know, want to try to eat him, maybe. I don't know. So he's got to kind of keep an eye out. So while one eye is watching the bug and when these guys are uh, kind of like creeping up on the bug, they don't want the bug or the, the other prey at it, maybe another small lizard or something. They don't want to see them coming. So these guys come very, very slowly, and they kind of just kind of blend in. They try to pretend like they're kind of part of the tree as well. I've seen some chameleons where, where they where they kind of take like a jerky walk like this, little steps at a time. They kind of just kind of – they try to kind of look like they're part of the branch, part of the tree, right. part, of, uh, part of the foliage there. And when they finally move, they're going to slowly, slowly kind of come creeping up. I'm going to say one eye while they're doing that one eye 
is watching that prey item. Okay, one eye is watching that bug. What's the other eye doing? Watching it's the predator. Behind it, above it, over here, over there, all over the place, watching for other predators. So what a perfect design. Let's try to get a good look at those eyes. What a perfect design for creeping up on prey when you can't hear anything. Both of those eyes work independently of each other. But when it's time for him to shoot that big, long, sticky tongue out, which is actually almost as long as his body is. Guys, wait, let's not include the tail. Almost as long as his body, his tail, his tongue bleh, bleh, comes flying out. It's a huge, sticky ball on the end of it. But when he's got to, he's got to have good aim when he does this, right? right? So when that tongue is just before that tongue comes shooting out, well, that's when both eyes are going to look. Both eyes are going to focus on that bug. And then when he shoots that tongue out, they'll hit it almost every single time. They've got great aim. 85% of the time, it works every time. Wow. That is the coolest. And it's sticky, right? Is that, that it is. Cool. Should we try? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> going to yeah, work. No, okay, no. we're going to give it a try. We're going to see him. He's going to for us, guys. If he does, this is going to be incredible. Doesn't it's still going to be pretty cool? Yeah. But let me see. I've got uh, something over here from Madagascar. Oh, oh my gosh! I found him. This is not a a prey item that I would want to. Uh, that I wouldn't want to lose, that's for sure. Uh, before I do this, guys, I just want to tell you that the veiled chameleon of Saudi Arabia uh, is not at risk. These guys are actually least concerned. They're doing pretty well. Their populations are pretty good in in uh, in Saudi. Uh, but for, for other species of, of chameleon and pretty much any chameleon or anything that, that lives in, in, in Madagascar, their friends, uh, I'd say almost all of them are, are at risk at, at some level at least. Uh, but for the veiled guys, they're, they're doing pretty good. They're doing pretty good. I have a quick now, question then. Quick question for you. So is there anything that we can do at home to help chameleons in Madagascar? Like, is there anything that, you know, whether it's donations or is it buying wood that are specific for, is there anything that we can do? That, that That's such a great question, you know, because, I mean, um, like loss of habitat and rainforest being cut down and that sort of thing. People living in Canada, when I talk to them, I find they always think like, I can't, I can't do anything about that. I go, I'm in Canada. I'm on the other side of the world. What am I going to do to help Madagascar? Even let's say even closer to home, the, the Amazon, like, what can I do guys? I can't do anything. Well, there's good things you can do every single day. And we hear about this all the time as well, just from conserving your water guys. It might not seem like a big deal to shut your, shut the water off while you're brushing your teeth, turn the water on, wet your toothbrush, turn it off, brush your teeth. Um, that definitely has an impact around the entire globe. Uh, recycling, make sure you are recycling at home. If your school doesn't have a recycling program or a compost program, maybe look into getting one set up. There's little things like that. Change the lights in your home. Use less energy. Turn the right. thermostat down. Guys, these are things that we can do on a daily basis in Canada that you think, oh, how is that going to affect Madagascar? It does. It definitely does. It affects the entire planet. And those are just like a, a, a few things off the top of my head. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, there's just so many. That's a whole nother show we can do on and on and on and on. Do you want to see me? Here, I'm yeah. going to see if. Uh, Let's, do it. Let's do it. We're going to try. I got a, a Madagascar, a little Madagascar hissing cockroach in my hand. Oh. And I don't know if he's going to sit still for me or. Can you see it on my arm? We can, yeah. <laughs> The suspense is real. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Like I said, this isn't. Uh, this is a definitely a prey item that uh, we don't want to lose. <laughs> we don't want to lose in the zoo. Okay, Camelio, you're not hungry. Maybe he's not hungry today. Okay, we're gonna. I got him. Da -da. His little eyes. I see. We can looking see at it. He's looking at it. 
Any guesses on the theme there so far, guys? Oh, I wonder. I don't I think, think. While we're waiting for uh, Camilio to eat, we did get a couple of lovely comments. One Let is here. Eric Callender, and he says, love you guys. Thank you so much, Eric. And then we also had another comment from Shane Connell. It says, hi, Kevin. Hi, Megan. Hey, you rock. Hey, Shana. He's not uh, hungry. I guess um, now what am I going to do with this? Eat it. <laughs> uh, not today. Not today. Okay, we're going to say goodbye to Camellio for now there, though, guys. The veiled chameleon. And uh, this is about an average size for, for a chameleon, guys, about the mid-range. Some chameleons do get very, very large, like the Parsons. Uh, part. Oh, did I lose you? No, did I lose you don't you? have any story. I'm just reading some comments here to see if there are any questions. The Parsons chameleon, guys, is gigantic. They can actually reach over two feet in length or about, about 27 inches or so or like – however many centimeters out of 68 centimeters. I don't know. Um, or then there's like the, the pygmy, the pygmy one, guys, the pygmy. Can I show you? The pygmy chameleon, tiny, tiny little guy like this. They're just super, super little. And then uh, the brochesia, I don't know if I'm saying this right, guys, the brochesia uh, micra. Guys, this new chameleon they've recently discovered is literally so tiny it could sit on the tip of my finger that little, like five, like, like I forget how big now, like 10 millimeters guys, super, super, super tiny. Um, anyways, we're going to put this guy away. Cause they okay. bought a Camilio. And then, and then, um, and again, this is on the theme. Oh, look at who's walking. What, know, who's walking? He's, he's been walking around he's behind running, you this whole time. It's he's really running full speed right now. He's running full speed right now. Full speed. You think I'll be so, able to get him? Oh, is that a catch? Well, uh, if, I were, if I was a chameleon, I don't think I'd catch him. No. You guys want to see something super extra cool and extra special? Is anyone well? I'm listening. Has anybody decided, or can anyone guess what the theme of the animals is today? No one so far has kind of written in what they think the theme is, Kevin. So maybe after we do another animal, I think this is going to be a giveaway. Yeah, okay, let's do it. <laughs> this will be a giveaway for sure. I hope so. I now hope I'm gonna bring my uh, I'm gonna bring my friend Amanda in here as well. She's bringing okay. our next animal in, um, and Amanda, let's get him right up. This, oh my gosh, he's so handsome. This is Wicket, okay, and Wicket is a Linnaeus. Two-toed sloth. Awesome. Oh. Hey, Kevin, somebody yep. guessed what it is. Joanne oh, Eleanor is. has guessed what the theme is today, and Ooh. it is slow-moving animals. Congratulations, Joanne. <laughs> Definitely slow-moving animals. And you can see all of these animals in one of our exhibits called Survival of the Slowest. Survival yeah. of the slowest travels all over North America, guys, to great museums and science centers. Uh, we had it here at the Niagara Butterfly Conservatory for a little while. For a little while. Uh, and I know it's, uh, it's at a museum in the United States right now as well. I forget which state. We've got a few uh, going right now. So, But the Linnaeus two-toed sloth, guys, an absolutely uh, incredible animal. It's one of the favorite animals that people come to see. And it's one of six... Uh, different species of sloth out there in the world. Okay, now there's two. We can say there's two types. We got two two toed, and isn't it like two finger two finger sloths? I think the it's two, either or two toed or two fingered. I mean, two toes and three toes. They all have three toes on their back feet, but it's the front feet, guys, that either have oh, either have two toes or three toes, and we have two different. We have two different species of two-toe. Like this is the Linnaeus two-toe sloth, and then there's the Hoffman's two-toed sloth, and then we have four different species, 
four different species of, of the three toad sloth. Right. And, and most sloth guys. Sorry, go, um, I, I was just going to say the, and it's the three toad sloths that are species at risk, right? Uh, yeah, definitely. And I mean, uh, most sloths are doing pretty well out there, guys. Okay. Um, when, when it comes to the Linnaeus and the Hoffman's two toad sloth, they're doing pretty good. They're least concerned out there. Um, when it when it comes to the uh, the like the brown throated and the pale throated uh, three toe sloths, they're doing pretty well. Also, they're they're also considered to be uh, least concerned. And there you are. Are you with me? Yes. Uh, sorry, everyone. Our um, our connection seems to be a little bit uh, a little bit sketchy today. I apologize. Right. I hope everyone is still enjoying. And please keep the questions and comments coming. So go ahead, Kevin. Our, our connection here is not the best either. But um, when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the maned sloth, okay, okay. they are considered uh, they are considered to to, to be vulnerable. Uh, big Papa, uh, they are definitely considered to be vulnerable. And then the pygmy sloth. Okay, the right. pygmy three-toed sloth is the smallest of all six species. They're, they're found on an island just off, off the coast of Panama. It's uninhabited by people. And uh, the last time they, that scientists went out there, uh, they, they, they counted about 100 of them. So these guys, the, 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 the pygmy sloth, they're guys, the pygmy three-toed sloth is critically uh endangered main sloth maned sloth uh vulnerable the other four species of sloth are doing they're doing pretty good guys and what a, an incredible i just gotta get this tortoise on <laughs> Really, really, also, guys, really, really well designed uh, for arboreal life. Whether it's right. the two toes or the three toes, those guys can hang from the tree. Like they'll hook their they'll they'll hook their toes in there. They hang upside down, and it it takes like almost no energy at all to hang on. They they I mean they sleep like that. They eat like that. Um, they pretty much do everything like that, except except for pooping. They they don't poop like that. So they'll actually they actually it's almost as if they do a little dance. They climb down, and this isn't very often there, guys. Okay, they have a very slow metabolic, uh, very very slow uh, metabolism, and uh, really low energy animals as well. I mean, they're, the 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 diet that they eat doesn't have a lot of energy, so they they're always conserving their energy. They 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 sleep quite a bit, and they also don't poop very often. But when they do, uh, this is when they're in the biggest danger uh, because sloths do have predators out there, guys, okay? Uh, so they'll climb down. They climb down all the way down to the bottom of a tree. They'll use their back feet, and they kind of, uh, like, they'll dig a little hole. And they, they poop in their hole, and then... They'll bury it again because they want to. I guess they want to hide their poop. They don't want other animals to know. Like, oh my gosh, there's this, a sloth poop here. Well, I mean, sloth poop means sloth, right? So all I have to do is look up. So they're going to hide that poop, to protect themselves. But when they're on that ground, guys, that's really, really when they're vulnerable. That's when they're in danger. Um, and I mean, there's all different types of animals, depending on how close to the water they are. Uh, anacondas could take them down. Uh, but probably their biggest, their biggest predator uh, would, would be jaguars again, guys. Those big cats, those big, beautiful cats uh, in, in South America. Um, you can definitely, definitely uh, eat sloths. I mean, it's really sad, but I mean, that's life, right? That's that science, guys. It's nature. Uh, that's yeah. what happened. But uh, guys, they do have another really uh, uh, an, another main predator. I just thought remembered this besides the uh, besides the jaguar, and this predator um, is, is going to be a danger to them when they're actually up in the trees. Okay, so harpy eagles. Harpy eagles are gigantically huge eagles. They can pick up a full-size 20-pound sloth in their talons, rip it from the tree, and fly away with it. These are huge, huge eagles. When the sloth is up in the tree, if they're close to the top of the tree, if they're high-hanging, 
if they're hanging upside down and their body is kind of shielded by the by the leaves, they're going to be a lot more, a lot better, better hidden to, for, for those eagles rather than like, I mean, if they're sitting on the top of the tree, they're fully exposed. You can see them. No problem there. I mean, it, it, it could be a reason why they like to hang upside down. It helps protect them. But they're also really designed for life upside down. Right. That's just the, that's just the, 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 the design <laughs> that they have. Kevin, we have a few questions. Um, okay. One of them is, is this the adult size? So uh, for Wicket, is it he an adult or she? Is, is this an adult size? Yeah, Wicket's about a year and a half old now. Yeah, Wicket is about a year and a half old now. Okay. So he's not full grown. He's going to get quite a bit bigger, actually. Right now, okay. I'd guess he's probably 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. He'll reach about twice that. Okay. Uh, but they don't really fully mature for about four or five years or so. So at a year and a half, he's still kind of like a juvenile. Not, a, not not necessarily a baby. I've seen some pretty small babies out there. Okay. Um, but uh, he's a juvenile. Cool. That fur looks really cool. Is it like, is it very soft or is it coarse? No, it, it, no it's, it is pretty soft. Um, it's not super soft like a bunny or a chinchilla or anything like that. I've always compared it to a German Shepherd. Okay. Like a, little, a little bit wiry, a little bit soft, you know, not like a too coarse or anything like that. Soft enough to be cuddly. Okay. A couple more questions here have just come in to you. How fast can they climb? Uh, I don't really have a like a <laughs> kilometers per hour or anything like that. But I mean, slowly. I've seen them climb a tree there, friends. And uh, I mean, they are definitely known to be slow animals. They're probably the, the most well-known uh, slow-moving animal out there. But that being said, I mean, there's exceptions to every rule in nature there, friends, right? And if these guys want to move fast, they can actually be pretty speedy. So if they're just kind of taking their time, they just had a nice, good, healthy poop, and, and they're gone their way back up to the, to the top of the tree, nothing's bothering them, I'll tell you, they're going to take their time. Okay. So and and they're like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to reach up. I'm going to get, get a grip. Okay. I got a good grip. I'm going to reach up my other arm. Now I'm going to get a good grip. Okay. Pull up my back legs, kind of taking their time. If there's an ocelot <laughs> charging at them. Okay. Another wild cat in South America. They're going to be like, oh my good, Oh my, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Okay, so they, they can move when they want to, uh, but if they do expend that energy, they're probably going to have a good nap if they escape yeah. that off. So who would win in a race, Wicket, Big Papa, or Camellio? Oh my gosh, what a great, <laughs> what a great, what a great I'm question! Kidding, I'm kidding. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what. If we put all three of them in the water, Wicket's going to win for sure because they're actually really good swimmers. How funny is that? Seeing a sloth swimming in the water you guys can look this up online there's great videos of sloths swimming they're actually great swimmers guys and it's like normal they're natural swimmers um but tortoise i'd say the sloth's gonna beat them both all right yeah. and Just last question. this one is from julia and she's asking how long do sloths live for yeah, that's a that's a really good question there as well. And I mean, it, it, it's uh, it, it's hard to say, really. I mean, how, how long do people live for? Right. It, it's a it's a pretty wide range there. Uh, but but in the wild, when it comes to the Linnaeus two toed sloth in the wild, I'd say maybe like 18, 18 years, 20 years or so. Uh, but guys living in captivity where there's no predators, there's regular vet checks. A regular healthy diet give it on a schedule um they've been known to live 40 years wow. to twice as long guys they actually do it for the Linnaeus two-toed sloth where uh it's a little bit easier to feed them uh the proper nutrients that they need compared to like some of the three-toed sloths they can actually do really really well in human care and live considerably longer than their wild cousins that's awesome yeah. uh I'm just going to read a couple of quick comments from a few people that were just great. Some people really love the lizard, so that was great. One says, Zachary is really enjoying this. Thanks for going live. So you're welcome, Zachary. Um, and, uh, yeah, so there's, a, like, everyone seems to be loving the animals. Um, but Let's do it again. Pardon? Let's do it again. Well, absolutely. We'll definitely yeah. have to do it again. 
Let's make again. this a thing. We'll make this a thing and we'll have to choose a different theme. Yeah. It would be great. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here with us, Kevin and Amanda as well. And thank you to all of your animals for hanging out with us today. This has been so much fun. I've been super super pumped for this so i'm really excited um and thank you for everyone watching for your questions your comments we really love it and this was our first episode so if you guys want more just give us a thumbs up in the comments and we'll make sure to do this again sometime soon and yeah until next time thank you so much for being here with us and thank yeah, you thanks so everyone. much to science thanks so much to science north out there and meg it's great to work with you again yeah, you as you well. Guys, care, guys, have a great day. We'll see you next time. All right, everyone, stay safe and have a great day. Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs>